welcome you to our 503rd in a series of distinguished speakers. I'm Ben Watkins, uh, club president. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Ed Cable, and if you would hold your applause until we get through everyone. Um, beginning on my far right, your left, is George Noya, who is originally from Albania. George is the director of finance and technology for Leadership Florida, an organization I'm sure you're all familiar with, an organization that convenes statewide community of leaders working for a better Florida. Also next to him is Nigel Adam, who's uh, president of Big Bend Hospice Foundation. And if you, if any of you have had uh, um, an opportunity to come in contact, tremendous organization, really know what they're doing, and uh, are really helpful at a difficult time in life. He's responsible for leading a variety of branding and fundraising activities to support the mission of the Big Bend. Um, Jessica Lowe Minor, who also you all know is an FSU grad and executive director of the Institute for Nonprofit Innovation and Excellence. So it's a management support organization founded in 2014, 2014 to strengthen capacity and the impact of the nonprofit sector through advocacy, education, and collaboration. Jessica is going to introduce our speaker, I believe, but I was, um, so as we were up here chatting, um, our speaker is, uh, his, uh, his background, this is going to be very interesting, so I just wanted to provide an overview of how this, um, how this fits into the Economics Club. And uh, so he started his career as a censure, so he was a global consulting firm, and now he is into marrying um, business with the nonprofit sector because the thought of the board was we need to have a program on nonprofits and how they impact the economy and what contribution they make in addition to their missions. And so that was the genesis of having Greg Vestry come and talk to you today. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica and let her introduce Greg. Jessica. So Greg Vestry has served as the president and CEO of numerous domestic and global organizations. He began his career with Accenture, a global consulting firm. And by his career's end with the company, he had been promoted to the president and CEO of a $40 million joint venture, which spanned across 18 countries, representing two thirds of the business. His total 19 years with Accenture left him with extensive experience in scaling, starting, and transforming organizations. In 2004, Greg launched Vestment as a family business and platform for pursuing opportunities to serve and give back to communities around the world. Greg joined the board of Food for the Hungry, a worldwide ministry that operates in over 70 countries and impacts over 2 million people. He served initially as a consultant to assess the overall challenges and opportunities within the organization's worldwide operations, and then stepped in to serve as the international president and CEO. In 2012, Greg joined Peter Maudit to co-found Investment Global Services with the intent to bring for-profit solutions to the nonprofit sector. The business expanded to include consulting for for-profit businesses who held the desire to integrate purpose with profit. This desire led to a strategic relationship with Aspen Heights, an innovative student housing company. Greg served as president for two years with the company, leading to its scaling by double each fiscal year. Greg remains a partner and executive advisor with Aspen Heights and focuses most of his time on Aspen Heights Awake, the 501c3 arm serving local communities in both the United States and Africa. Greg and his wife, Jean, who's here, live in Austin, Texas. Thank you so much, Greg. Wow, good afternoon. This is quite a group. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. I'm uh, looking forward to maybe a bit of a whirlwind trip. Uh, we're going to talk about Africa, we're going to talk about lots of different things. So if I could, just a bit of context for my audience. Um, who has ever been to Africa? Uh, who has ever done business in Africa? Nice. Nice. Okay. Um, who uh, runs a business or works in the business sector? Alright. Who works in the government services sector? 
Uh, anybody work in the foreign government services sector? Okay. And uh, is there anybody from East or South Africa? West. West? <laughs> Ghana. Yeah? Ghana? Nigeria. Nigeria. Nice. Um, very nice. Uh, I'm always, uh, it's always fun when I meet folks from Africa because they're shocked to actually understand the geography. I actually speak a little Swahili. I'm learning Amharic. Uh, I know two words in Amharic, by the way. <laughs> so don't, don't, get, don't get too, uh, too excited. Um, but my Swahili's a bit better. So <clears throat> I'm going to go, uh, let's go through a few things. Um, I know I already got an invitation or an introduction. Uh, <clears throat> this is a bit of my lifeline, and I thought, out of respect for you, to get a chance to know a bit more about me, uh, I'm going to highlight a couple of things. Uh, the waves up and down are actually probably emotional waves up and down, so <laughs> uh, I'm a very sincere and honest kind of guy. Uh, I loved my 20 years at Accenture. I would do it exactly the same. I got so much benefit, so much training. Uh, I was the asset for the organization, and I benefited from that greatly. But I realized I didn't really ever start a company. And when you're in a big firm, it's like you know running something with training wheels. So I said, you know what, I need that garage experience. So it was me and two other folks. I was the one writing the payroll checks for 10 months, praying that we would actually get some customers that I wouldn't stop paying the payroll checks, because uh, Gene kept asking. Um, and uh, after that, I just kind of felt like great garage experience, learned how to start a company from scratch, did not scratch the itch for purpose. And I really felt like there was more desire for me to have purpose. So. I joined the, food of, uh, the board of Food for the Hungry, and within two board meetings realized that the operations were struggling, were in disarray, uh, it had outgrown its infrastructure, and they said, hey Greg, would you mind being the international president and CEO of a 35 country, 3,500 staff, one to two million people touched annually, and I was, <laughs> sounded like a great idea. Uh, my first day on the job was in Bangkok as the international president and CEO, the CFO comes in and he says, two things you need to know. We need 24 vehicles tomorrow, and we're out of cash. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is like trying to do a jackknife off your kitchen table with no spring. <laughs> so, but I did that for four years, a uh, miraculous event. Food for Hunger is a tremendous organization. Uh, what we did to create foundation for it to scale worked, uh, and they're thriving and flourishing. We'll talk about that just a little bit. The rest of my, uh, my career has been more focused on uh, taking investment global services, focusing on consulting, doing impact investing, numerous things. My days are totally different. I was up early this morning because Ethiopia is eight hours ahead. I'm the president and CEO of uh, a consultancy in Ethiopia. Uh, I know it's probably everybody's average daily job, but uh, I, we do a lot of work in Africa. We do a lot of work where we actually serve as an interim leader for an organization. We bring a lot of credential, a lot of capacity to help get things off the ground. Uh, my partner is the chief operating officer of a software tech company in South Africa, so we just do things uh, all over the world. All over the world. Um, my wife and I have a family of five kids. Uh, we have a family vision statement to be a big family that loves one another, serves one another, and impacts 100 million lives. That's pretty cool. The reason they know that is because they travel the world with us at Food for the Hungry. <clears throat> They've seen what it's like and they know what poverty looks like. But more than anything, they learned that change happens multi-generational. That if, if I get to stand on the, the, the shoulders of people before me, they get to stand on our shoulders and progressing them forward. This is my wife, Jean. Jean is the, uh, she is the hub of our family. Uh, she's fantastic, um, and I'm thrilled. I don't get to travel very often with my wife, but when we said Florida, beach, sand on my toes, uh, she's born and raised in central Florida down near Plant City. So she said, yes, I'll go, and yes, you need to speak. Um, Gary Zanders, our chief operating officer, chief financial officer, very steep, one of our most steep in development. He spent over 30 years in development. He's also done business. He's, a, he's an accountant, uh, numerous other things. So with that, let me, uh, I kind of gave you a bit of, and this is just a little bit hard to see here. Um, our goal for investment global services is to impact 10 million lives. That's our vision. That's what we're focused on. That drives everything we do. Anything we do, we look at and say, is there a trusted relationship? What's the impact? And then we think about revenue and long-term value. We provide consulting services and we do impact investing. If you've never heard of impact investing, uh, we started doing that about six, seven years ago. We saw that in the, the nonprofit sector, people would donate maybe 10% of what they had. 
And we said, well, what are they doing with the rest of the 90%? Why can't we put frames together that maybe they could invest in that looks just like a muni bond or an equity investment? Why can't we figure something out? So we really endeavored to do that. So I'm going to talk about just a few things. <clears throat> I believe it's the age of the economic realm. We think the economic realm is going to be a major driver for social impact. I'm going to explain how we've seen it, how we've done it, how we've supported organizations doing it. And then I'm going to talk about Africa. I heard I'm the first speaker who's ever talked about Africa, so uh, it's fun for me. So if I talk fast and I get passionate, it's just because it is. Um, and then we're going to talk about delivering social impact inside a business. Uh, share a couple ideas on that. So <clears throat> when I was at Food for the Hungry, one of the things I learned was I asked some of our best and brightest. I said, tell me how social transformation has happened. Where are the success stories? What came out of that was they said the best transformation holistically comes when you think about the social, political, and economic realm in tandem. You can't do it without the pieces, uh, or you can't do it just individually. So when you look at this, if you look at the slide, on the social side, you've got organizations very dedicated, some of the most dedicated people I've ever met, the most servant-hearted people that are in the nonprofit sector, uh, in the medical profession, things like that. They're focused on charity, they're focused on serving. In the political sector, the, the role of the political sector is to make sure that there's uh, welfare, welfare for the, those that are, that are in need and that there's aid for them. But the other part that's actually more important, think about what we just said with the flag, justice for all. We are so fortunate. Uh, we could, we, I, could, I could walk you from country to country and tell you what it's like when the fabric of justice doesn't exist. It debilitates countries. And our, our political realm is so important to create that justice factor, but the other is to create policies. Policies to protect people from business that maybe go awry. Policies for uh, just how society operates. The economic realm is about jobs and livelihoods. And I'm gonna talk some more about why this is important. We, we actually put the economic realm, it's probably not uh, maybe fairly represented, but we, we decided six, seven years ago, we said, you know what? Why don't we put a big focus on working with the for-profit sector? We can bridge the nonprofit and for-profit sector together. We know how to speak both languages. Um, and we, we actually might be able to get the economic realm to use the energy it has to propel things forward for social impact. Now let me just give you a few reasons why we personally <clears throat> believe the social and the political sector is, is lagging. The first is on the social side. All of us have seen a macro trend changing in the last five to ten years when it comes to nonprofits. There's this sense of, hey, are you creating dependency? Um, is there a focus on welfare aid? Is that empowering or is it imprisoning? These are hard questions. You know, there's lots of books written about do no harm. When you're trying to help, you have to have and ask yourself, are we doing harm or helping? It's a real challenge. Uh, I remember being in the Congo, where I had an appendicitis, by the way, and I also got really sick. Um, so, <clears throat> but we're in the Congo, and my, my regional director for Africa, we're about to take a three and a half hour drive out to one of our operations, and he said, uh, why are we helping these people anyway? And I thought, Oh my goodness, that's my Africa director. <laughs> but <laughs> I think we might have some issues. Um, but what I saw was, and this happens in the nonprofit sector all the time, they're constantly asking, are we creating dependency? Are we doing harm? Are we doing it the best we can? If you want to change human behavior, if you want to help people in, in tough situations, it's difficult. It's a real challenge. I never thought, we used to joke at Accenture, my partner would come in sometimes and he'd say, hey, why are you guys taking so long? We're not trying to solve world hunger. And then all of a sudden I become the president and CEO of Food for the Hungry. <laughs> and we try to solve the hunger. Um, so on the political realm, there's not a political statement, it's just kind of a political perspective. If you look at it, one of the things that's on my mind is just what's the, what's the percentage of debt compared to GDP, gross domestic product? We, there's a lot of debt out there. And as countries, we want to help. And as, a, as an American nation, we're very giving. We're actually very well and highly regarded as a giving nation. And people really appreciate that. But at the same time, you begin to look at it and say, how far can we go? And when you start to think about not just what we do from a business or an economic perspective, but how we help other countries, we've got a sizable debt. And I know this has been a conversation for decades. I was somewhere and I read a book from the 1970s and they said, gosh, our debt as a percent of GDP is way out of control and here we are four years later and <laughs> it's a little bit bigger. But let me offer this. When it comes to these realms, economic, social, and political, if the opportunity is for the three to work together, the question is, what's the common purpose? And how can you come together with a common purpose? And I'm going to walk you through a case 
of a credit union in, Florida, uh, in Texas that we've done some work with that I think might give you a good example. But take a minute, if you would, what's the definition of purpose? So, <clears throat> when I look at this, I think about how we can team together. And I'm going to give an example. About 10 years ago, I was in Austin, Texas, and I was just kind of doing a lot of international work. <clears throat> One of the things that came up was people from, a, from all three realms were beginning to ask themselves the question, why do we have such an issue in foster care? Why do we have so many challenges? Um, some statistics my wife and I heard, we were working with a group this weekend. They're, they stayed at our house. They're, they're working on helping women that are sex trafficked creating a program in Austin, and he said 86% of sex trafficked individuals come from the foster care system. Holy cow. Wow. Never heard that statistic. Now, why do they pick foster care? Because they don't have family. Um, it's, it's a challenge. In Austin, about 8, 10 years ago, um, the businesses, the nonprofits, the government, uh, the churches said, we've got to solve this problem. And I'm what. <clears throat> So, it's working. It's amazing to see the city of Austin coming together for a very big challenge. <clears throat> so, for those of you in the, in the room that are in business, let me offer this. Because sometimes I feel like that bridge between for-profit and the non-profit sector, it's just kind of like, how does it fit together? We work with companies all the time and we ask them, what are your core competencies? What is it you as a business do that could be something that makes social impact. We call it the fulcrum. Um, <clears throat> the second thing we talk to businesses about is, we know you're a citizen in the community, but when you're a prominent business in the community, is there an opportunity to become a citizen leader? And we talk to CEOs about this all the time, because there's a difference. You're, if you're given great things, you know, to those who are given um, much, much is expected. And I think for our businesses, we, we really feel like this is a realm, this is an opportunity, and this is a chance to partner with the nonprofit sector, to partner with the governments to figure out how do we have a common purpose. So for those in the room that are, that are in business, find your fulcrum. And I want you to think about it just for a little bit, and I'm going to give a couple of examples of how we work with some other companies to bridge that and to find that fulcrum. So <clears throat> let's uh, cross the ocean. Uh, shall we talk about Africa? So. Uh, let's begin with the picture on the right. Uh, does anybody really truly realize how big the continent of Africa is? It's massive. You could fit China, the United States, Europe, uh, a couple of other ancillary countries inside the, the land mass of Africa. It's huge. Uh, I've had a couple of clients say, hey, would you take me on a trip to a couple of countries in Africa? And I was like, how long have you got? And oh, by the way, you know, KQ, Kenya Airways may bump you off a flight, and you might have to go tomorrow or the day after, and everything changes. It's just different. Um, Africa's a continent full of countries. Uh, a lot of us look at it like it's a country. It's actually numerous countries. Um, most countries in Africa were liberated from colonialism in only the last 60 years. So think about it. We look at Africa sometimes thinking, oh my goodness, she's a mess. She's got conflict. She's got crisis. She's got issues. But... If you had just become a country and somebody else drew your boundary lines and you had tribes that never got, got together, never worked together, never wanted to be together, it, it's, a, it's a unique situation. So when you're looking at Africa, these countries that are now in these uh, boundaries, they're trying to figure out government. They're trying to figure out who has control. They're trying to figure out who the leadership is. They're trying to figure out their justice system. It's brand new. It's different. So <clears throat> we do a lot of work in East and South Africa. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about that a bit more, but here's the, here's, the, here's the main thing I want you to hear. I've done a lot of work with Accenture. I saw uh, the global economy migrating to where the cheaper labor is. It's just the nature of things. It's the way it works. So imagine when outsourcing went to the ASEAN countries, and then migrated to Eastern Europe when the Eastern Bloc uh, fell, and then it went to India and China. It just follows. It's the nature of the global economy. Africa is the next China. Africa is experiencing what we experienced in three separate segments, and most developed nations have experienced in separate segments, 
they're going to see an agricultural, an industrial, and a technology revolution at the same time. It's phenomenal. I was in uh, Kenya three years ago. Oh my goodness, uh, the infrastructure, which when I see infrastructure, it's roads, it's pipes for water, it's electricity, it's all those basics. Uh, so hard. Um, so hard to get from one place to another, but uh, in the last three years, the amount, of in, the amount of roads that they've built is amazing. Ethiopia, booming. Uh, if you ever go to Uganda, Kampala is the city center. I, 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 I was on the road for three hours trying to get from the airport to city center. These countries are building infrastructure, and, I'm gonna, and the reason that's important is because when you, wanna, when you wanna develop a nation, there's, there's really four things that we believe are, are fundamental. And that's not just our point of view, that's from a development standpoint. Uh, infrastructure, education, small medium enterprise, and technology. Those four components are nation building. So <clears throat> a couple of things you may not know, when I was the president of uh, Food for the Hungry, back in 2006, they were laying fiber optic cable under the Indian Ocean. When I saw that happening, I thought, this continent is going to dramatically change. It's going to be a big shift. Here we are in 2017. I can get better broadband in Kenya sometimes than I can here. Kenya's uh, on the East Coast. That's right where the fiber optic came in. That fiber optic is just booming across the continent. Uh, they're building two high-speed rails, <clears throat> one going through Tanzania, one going through Kenya. And the reason is they're going into the country because Africa's going to be the food basket. Africa has tremendous fertile soil. She's got tremendous opportunity. She's got tremendous farmers. Uh, you're also looking at industrial. So think about China, the price of, of products and things in China. Africa's going to be able to produce products at a much cheaper cost, but you have to have a way to get it in and out. So think about it. High-speed rail going into Africa. Ethiopia has a high-speed rail. Now, they can only go half the speed because it seems like the pastoralists, which are farmers, uh, they keep somehow getting their camels on the railroad track. Um, and the funny, that's not a funny thing, um, but the interesting thing is the government pays them double the value of the market rate, so I know what I do with my camels. <laughs> just a business guy. So let me just give you a few things. Um, I brought the newspaper with me, it's called The Capital. Uh, whenever I go to Africa, I do two things. I try to get a, new, uh, a U.S. paper and I try to get uh, an African paper, whichever country I'm going to and I read it from front to back because it's just really quick context. So I pulled a couple of things for you. I was just in both Kenya and Nairobi, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, there's the same place, Kenya and Ethiopia. <clears throat> we do a lot of work in both countries. The picture on the very top, it's a little hard to see, but this is from a 18, no, 12 story building in Nairobi. Nairobi is the city, uh, the capital of Kenya, very progressive. Um, those little sticks you see, see standing up, yes, that's scaffolding. Uh, they use wooden scaffolding. Um, I think we need to give them some global safety and uh, standards. But <clears throat> what you can't quite see in the picture is uh, my partner and I were there. We were looking at, we're doing property development uh, there. Uh, 25 cranes. 25 cranes across Nairobi city center and the outskirts. So let's look at Tallahassee and count the cranes, right? Cranes tell you when you've got major development. They're booming. Um, on the far left uh, is the picture of that building from the ground up. Uh, the people that are in that picture, so I run uh, Verdon Consulting. Verdon Consulting is a consultancy in Ethiopia. Three of them are lawyers, two of them are accountants. Um, now, I never imagined running a consultancy with lawyers, but I now understand why. Um, when you're doing work in the developing nations, the legal regulations, the regulatory requirements for starting up a PLC, which is the company, it's like an LLC here, or a limited company in Kenya, you have to have lawyers. You just can't navigate without them. Uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of issues, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute. Look at the article in the middle. Air, Airbnb has seen significant growth in Africa. It's booming. So people are starting to buy apartments or flats and fixing them up for the, the global traveler. Because Airbnb, when we look at it, it's just another picture. And what do they need in, in countries in Africa? You know what they need? They need USD. Because when you're building a nation and you're taking on a lot of debt to build roads and other things, the most stable currency on the planet is USD. I'm grateful for it every time I go. It's, it's amazing. Uh, in Ethiopia, they have the Buren, 
which is burr, but that's how they say it. Um, it just devalued 20%. They think it'll probably devalue another 20%. So imagine trying to do business and your money devalues by 20%. It's not easy to do business with that. Kenya's got the Kenyan shilling. But they want USD. Uh, USD is uh, quite powerful. Free skies for Africa. <clears throat> so imagine Delta is headquartered in Atlanta. Because Delta is so significant in Atlanta, Atlanta uh, Georgia, Georgia decides that no other airline can fly in, into Georgia. That's what it's like in Africa. A lot of these countries created airlines, they put a lot of money into it, and the airline, and a piece of equipment can cost you close to, what, half a, half a billion? So they created these airlines, but they said, hey, no one else can fly here because we want our airline to be profitable, to survive, etc." The African Union, which is very strong, uh, is across uh, all the African countries. They are trying, their number one agenda item is to open air travel across the countries. So go back to the conversation earlier. If you have air travel, that's much more fluid and frequent. If you have train travel, high-speed train travel, the economy is booming, the economy is growing. Now, is it perfect? Is it you know all up to speed? No. That little thing that looks like a calculator on the right, every day for Vernon Consulting, we have to punch in how much money we make. <laughs> it's nuts. Um, it's just the way the government does it right now. <clears throat> so, lots of progress, lots of opportunity. So, look at Africa. Africa's GDP growth. Hey, I'll tell you what, I take some of these numbers 8.3 in 2016 for Ivory Coast, Ethiopia 7.6. Here's the deal <clears throat> this does not include the cash based portion of the economy. Everybody I talk to says double those numbers. Double. So imagine Ethiopia at 14, 15% growth. Because there's a thing called M Pesa. Uh, back in 06 or 08, Safaricom set up a technology called M Pesa. On your cell phone, <clears throat> you put in a code. That code is, is where money will get sent. They had mobile money back in 06. We didn't have mobile money. Uh, we've got Venmo, Cash App, other things. You know, Bank of America just announced that there's some app that you can now move money around. They've been doing it since 08. Here's what's going to happen in Africa. Africa's going to be a lot like a lot of other nations that have developed a later stage. They're going to leapfrog. And they don't have the regulatory issues. They don't have the infrastructure. Think about the ASEAN countries. They never put landlines in for phone. They jumped to cellular. Save them a huge investment. Think about Sprint, Verizon, AT&T. All those guys spent billions of dollars. Here's another thing. <clears throat> all of the countries in Africa, not all, excuse me, uh, you can't, and you can't blank, I can't blank in Africa. It's, there are countries that are leading, there are countries that are still struggling. Uhuru Kenyatta is the president of uh, Kenya. <clears throat> um, he just made a pronouncement that he wants one million low-cost homes to be built in the next five years. That represents 200,000 a year, 17,000 a month, 555 homes built in a day. Now, why would he do that? The reason he's doing that is because think about our economy. We always talk about from an economic standpoint, you want middle income. Middle income drives an economy. You need small, medium enterprise. They drive the jobs in an economy. The Kenyans are stepping up. They're really progressing. It's one of the most progressive in Africa. Uh, it's one of my favorite countries. They don't have housing for the Kenyans to move into. It, it, they can't afford it. Uh, an acre of land in Nairobi city, city Center costs $1.5 million U.S. <clears throat> in the outskirts, we're looking at doing some housing for uh, international uh, travelers and others. Uh, still $1.5 million. $1 million to $1.5 million for an acre. So think about it. where are the Kenyans going to live? Where the, where's the average worker going to live? They're going to start going north into Machapas County and other places. But that's a huge demand. Every country that's booming, that's trying to build this infrastructure, you either invest or you're going to lose out. Therefore, foreign exchange is significant. And I'm going to talk about China and a couple of others uh, here in a minute about what that looks like. So, let me just go through, I said industrial, agricultural, technology, technological uh, advancement all at the same time. The industrial growth is strong. Even if you take oil and gas, which has boomed in Africa, we actually talk about it a lot. If you have gold or oil and gas, it's actually a bit of a scourge of the economy. It really, it really kind of creates a big bent. Uh, it's not our favorite thing. But even if you strip out uh, oil and, and gas in the, in the production of that, because it's really declined uh, in Africa, you're still looking at economies that are at 4.3, 4.4% 4 .4 growth. But remember, double it. 
because that doesn't include the cash. So on average, across countries in Africa, you're looking at 4% growth. 4% growth, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little jet lagged probably still since I got back this week, but I don't know where GDP growth is for this year, projected 3.2. Anybody know? Yeah, about that? Agricultural. Um, <clears throat> uh, in countries in Africa, do what they call small plots. You have families, families have kept their land, they've had children, they've split the land up. Uh, you don't have large agri-farms, you don't have a lot of large agribusiness, but it's coming and it's, it's really making a difference. Countries in Africa are, are welcoming foreign, direct foreign investment for agricultural development. They want the yield, they want the growth, they want their people fed. The technology leapfrog, a uh, couple of key statistics up here. <clears throat> um, uh, and I'm going to talk about technology just a little bit because I think everybody needs to understand s some changes that will happen for, for Africa. Um, uh, right now, there are about 620 million people in Africa that don't have power. Um, that's a lot of people, but it's coming. <clears throat> Ethiopia is going to be one of the largest power generators in Africa. They do a lot of hydro. Uh, you're going to see uh, countries in Africa leapfrog to microgrids, renewable, and hydro. Uh, they'll do less coal and natural gas. <clears throat> uh, they're, they're just getting the opportunity to catch up and learn from, from some of the things we've dealt with. Um, let me walk you through a company. So if you're going to do work in Africa, if you're going to do business in Africa, there's a thing we call a social license. So if you have a business license and you have a social license, if you want to be successful in Africa, you can get a business license. But if you don't have a social license, which means you care for the people, you care for the growth of the country, you care for the growth of the economy and all that it entails and, and sharing opportunity, you won't be successful. The, the businesses that go in and say, there's a, there's a, we're going to solve business and social problems in tandem, they win. So, chairman of the board of Delta Energy and Communications, a longtime friend of mine, um, he called up one day and he said, hey, we invent, innovated this product. It's going to track uh, energy theft in developing nations. Uh, and I said, great, what are you going to do about the riots? He's like, what riots? I was like, well, the riots you're going to create when you shut the power off because I know that's what they're going to do. He was silent, 30 seconds. He's like, Hey, uh, what are you doing? Um, can you come help? So we, uh, as VGS, one of the things we do is we're not afraid to try to solve business and social problems in tandem. Having done development, having done a lot of work on human transformation, change management, you know, in this setting, you have to do both. Delta Energy created a product. <clears throat> it's called Smart Grid 2.0. We have Smart Grid 1.0 in the U.S. The bandwidth of, your, of our Smart Grid is about the size of my pinky. You're looking at, um, oh gosh, uh, you know, 10K, uh, you know, 12K. It's really small. I can tell you know what you're talking about. Um, they've innovated a product that is Smart Grid 2.0. What Smart Grid 2.0 means is that your, your house has a smart meter. The transformer has another uh, meter on it that's, tra that's tracking power. Um, and if you, can, if you can create a pipe uh, of information from, uh, no, let me step back, sorry. I know this too well. They created a product that goes on top of a transformer. It tracks the power. The reason that's important is because if there's energy theft, they need to know, the power company needs to know where the energy theft is because they have to go solve that problem. They just happened to make this decision and innovated the idea of what if we put a Wi-Fi chip in that box? It's got the, what's called the 802.11S technology, some of the latest Wi-Fi technology. 802.11S, the S means it's a Wi-Fi wireless mesh. So imagine having like five Starbucks, uh, it's like five houses, five Starbucks, super powered Wi-Fi, you're looking at 100 gig, which is what we can maybe get, like I get 70 gig in my house, you know, we got a lot of kids that do Netflix. Um, <laughs> Intel just invested in this company, uh, in the technology, they're, uh, they're creating a, a, a 5G chipset to go in that box. 5G is going to provide up to 200 to 300 gig. Now, Africa doesn't have a broadband network. They don't have some of this te technology. They have power poles. So they're extremely interested. And oh, by the way, they're investing in infrastructure. Guess what's going to happen? They're going to leapfrog. They're going to get this stuff just like the ASEAN countries got mobile. Now, here's the great news. This may be a lifetime achievement award for us as VGS and as a family because we're talking about bringing broadband to the masses in the developing nations, and they're going to invest in it, and they're going to get the benefit of this. So, but here's the other part of it. 
Delta Energy has a social license. They said, look, we're not here to just make money. We're not here to just solve this power theft issue. We're here to bring power to people. We're here to bring broadband because broadband creates better education. It creates better jobs. They created a thing called Delta Squared. Delta Squared is the other half. It's the social, it's the social response. We spent three to 400 hours doing desk research trying to figure out where there are case studies of solving energy theft in a social setting. And we found one called, uh, it's in a slum uh, called Kailich. Kailich is in South Africa, it's the single biggest, largest slum. UK firm came in, innovated, uh, changed, the, changed the game, and we're gonna leverage those best practices to deal with the social issue. It just takes work, it takes context. Here's another technology company. Now the reason I keep telling you about technology is because the number one inhibiting factor for people to do business in Africa, to invest in Africa, is corruption, lack of governance, and, uh, and issues like that. We have several companies that are tech companies. Technology is going to be the corruption killer, period. So <clears throat> we have a company called Webmaster. They're a client of ours. They're automating all the government services in Kenya and other countries. So instead of going up and asking for your renewed driver's license, you just do it online. Now, if you've been to Africa, you go up to the line and you ask, can I renew my license today? And they say, well, of course you can. That's the today line. It's 100 USD. This is tomorrow's line. So if you want to wait, or maybe later today, so that's the way corruption happens. It seems like a service fee, lots of things. But when it's automated, there's no human involved. Each government office is seeing 5x revenue growth in government tariff, government tax, that they should have been getting anyway. And if you're going to build infrastructure, you need that money. You can't grow the nation. This is another one, Privy Seal. Founder was a lawyer. Someone stole his identity, his professional identity, created a company in Seychelles, which is off the coast of Africa, and started charging people retainers. And <clears throat> next thing you know, um, the legal group, uh, sorry, the government comes up and says, hey, we'd like to ask you about this company. And he's like, I never did that. So he set out to try to build ecosystems of trust. They, uh, they bit of the exercise we went through, because I want to I want to now help give some specific examples of how bridging business and nonprofits work. On the right-hand side, we met with the board and the management team in a retreat. We were laying out how, what was their fulcrum? What were their core competencies? They do lending. They do financial services of all sorts and kinds. The nonprofit organization in Austin did all the research on the right-hand side. Those 10 boxes are affordable housing, mobility, transport, health access and outcomes, education attainment, economic empowerment, career readiness, etc. The business did not do that research, the nonprofits did. They understand that context way better. So they blessed the business of the University of Federal Credit Union by doing all that research. Now all UFCU had to do is to say, what's our core competency? What can we bring to make social impact? Where all the red dots are is where they said they could do. The yellow ones are their second ones, which they're also on the list. <clears throat> Here's another example. I'm gonna take a bit of a stretch. That's, so that's University of Federal Credit Union. When we were starting out uh, BGS, we just felt like it was an injustice. We, we felt like, um, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. You really have to steward the people that work in a nonprofit. They're passionate, they're energized. But in our case, we didn't have vehicles. My first day, we, were at, we needed 24 vehicles. I tried my entire presidency for four years to figure out a way to get them. The president behind me, my partner Peter, tried for several more years. And then we met with the president after us and said, hey, what can we do to help? And he's like, you guys, you can solve my problem. <laughs> I need vehicles because I have to get staff to the field. So here's what we did. We said, huh, we tried everything inside the four walls of the nonprofit. What if we try a for-profit model to solve the nonprofit's issues? So we innovated doing asset financing. If you're in business, you do asset financing all the time. You take a loan for a car, you take a loan for a building, whatever it is, but that asset is collateral. That's the way it works. So we said, okay, <clears throat> we had to challenge the board. How many of you are board members of a nonprofit? Okay. It takes courage to do this. Um, I can't tell you how many business executives that I coach that I say, look, please, when you walk into the boardroom, and my wife's a board member, so I coach her all the time, <clears throat> we, uh, you have to bring your courage into the boardroom. 
and it's, it's, you know, these for-profit models can make a big difference. So we provided asset financing for 20 vehicles, um, impacting over 300,000 lives. Um, last thing on the asset financing, and then I'll skip through because I know we're running out of time. Asset financing, the way we innovated this, it's a trifecta of impact. <clears throat> we provided a million dollars of loans to the nonprofit Food for the Hungry. That was our first client. They bought a, a group of vehicles. They paid for the principal, the interest, the maintenance, the insurance for those vehicles over the next five years. Paid them off completely. The next five years, they kept taking that same money for principal and interest and putting it into a savings account. At the end of 10 years, they sold the vehicle, they sell the vehicle for 60% of its value. And I know that's not the same here, it's different in developing nations. So at the end of 10 years, they have 1.6 times the money they borrow. So a million dollar loan is worth 1.6 million in working capital. So those of you who are accountants and finance experts, that's a lot of money, and that's financial self-sustainability. Um, uh, I'm gonna skip a few things here, just in the essence of time. Um, here's uh, Aspen Heights, was a company that I worked for, I was the president <clears throat> uh, for a couple of years. We did a program. Uh, we have 30,000 students, we provide student college housing for, and we said, hey, students, why don't you go with us to Africa? And uh, it was a huge failure. <laughs> um, but what we realized was we wanted to meet the students where they were. So we ran a national contest, and we said, hey, look, you guys have passion, energy, time. What we can provide is maybe capital. So we ran a contest, and we said, for your student organization, bring forward your philanthropic uh, initiative. And whoever gets the most likes on Facebook wins $1,000 towards that initiative. And then the winners uh, went to a national contest where they won $5,000. The key is we had 100,000 fans on Facebook. We opened up our entire Facebook population to those students and to their causes. That was us being authentic, saying, if you're in our community, we're in your community. Uh, we saw almost uh, uh, responses from every continent other than Antarctica, which just gets a little cold. Um, so last thing, um, you know, looking at businesses and how you track impact, uh, if you look at this, <clears throat> some of the impact for Aspen Heights was focused on their core competency. They do construction. They're good at it. They know how to do it. They know students. So we said, if that's part of our core competency, that's the population we're going to work with. That's some of the kind of work we're going to do. The second part was, they felt like their fulcrum was that they're a human development company. Extremely progressive. They said they just happen to make money doing property development and management. So they focused on providing their staff an opportunity to go to East Africa on a trip, 10 days paid time off in addition to their vacation, an interest-free loan for 12 months, uh, training sessions before they go and then when they return. Very interesting. You talk about retention, people feel like you're giving them personal development as well as professional, very unique. Um, and then focusing on the 30,000 students, that they engage those students to help them where they were. So, my last point is businesses who emerge from being a citizen to a citizen leader uh, and integrating purpose with profit will lead the competition. We're only four people, we're a firm of experts. We set out to impact 10 million lives. <clears throat> we're at about 2.3 in about five years and we're shocked. Uh, we're not that good, uh, we're just focused. And Gary does all of our impact tracking, uh, very well steeped in international standards. Uh, we're thrilled. <clears throat> and thank you very much for the time. Um, we hope you find a bridger, um, someone that knows business and development. Uh, we hope you develop them because they're necessary for this stage. Thank you. <laughs>